Give me a thumbs yes. up or something when you want to yes. start. And the question I have here is from Sally Ann in Taranaki, and she is asking, you know, how likely is it that Mount Taranaki will erupt? And if it does erupt, what will happen? So thanks, Sally Ann, for the question. And the short answer is Taranaki will erupt again in the future, and aspects of the eruption will be similar to what we've seen in the past there. So when Taranaki erupts, um, there are three or four types of eruption. The first one is ash fall. That's when an explosion occurs. A tall ash column grows above the volcano and the wind blows it away and the ash will fall downwind on the community. The other is when lava reaches the surface and that can form a lava flow or a lava dome. The domes, they'll be in the crater at the top while a lava flow that will come down the side of the volcano. Now, if that dome collapses or some part of the volcano collapses, we'll have avalanches down the side of the volcano. And these can destroy everything. Um, they, they travel very fast and they're hot and can reach out to maybe 10 or 15 kilometers. The other feature we'll see at Taranaki is lahars. And that is when the snow is melted and these generate volcanic floods off the volcano. They also can travel large distances and even reach the coast. So I hope that sort of explains what may happen at Taranaki for you. Thanks, Sally Ann. So I've, I've, I've taken the opportunity of, a, of, of the lockdown to, um, to grow a mohawk, which I thought um, maybe something that um, I could perhaps hide a little bit maybe for, 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 for this video. Yeah, I like it. It's good. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's go for it then. The question is from Cole uh, from Turanga. And uh, the question is, is there enough pressure so that a volcano can crack or split in half? So the quick answer is volcanoes don't normally do that. Um, it would take an enormous amount of pressure and it's often not possible. However, pressure can cause a few things at volcanoes. They can create some cracks, uh, which can create some earthquakes that we can record with seismometers. And pressure can also create some bulging of the ground surface that we can record with a GPS. So we're not talking a huge amount, we're talking millimeters uh, or centimeters. And both earthquakes and, um, and ground deformation are used as one of the, the symptoms we monitor as an indicator of the presence of, of magma underground. In very extreme cases, um, we can have a volcano bulging to the point where it becomes unstable and then collapse. But this is extremely rare. And we've seen that in the past at uh, Mount St. Helens in uh, 1980, uh, quite a long time ago. I've never done this before, so it's good to try new things. Leanne from Naruwahia asks, I feel quite safe living near Hamilton in regards to natural disasters, but I wonder if there was an eruption in one of our active volcanoes, would lava or ash reach Hamilton? That's a great question. And it's true that uh, Hamilton is quite removed from most perils that New Zealand faces. In terms of volcanoes, there's no active volcano near Hamilton. So Hamilton is quite safe from the proximal hazards. So those are the hazards that stick close to the vent and lava flow would be considered one of those. So yeah, Hamilton is not likely to receive a, a lava flow anytime in the uh, near future. But ash is something that Hamilton could face. So all New Zealand's volcanoes can produce volcanic ash. And where ash goes depends on how high that eruption column is and what direction the wind is blowing that day. So Hamilton could receive ash in a volcanic eruption, which is really unlikely to kill you, but it will make your life a lot less pleasant and more challenging. So from Trevor Wellington, how is it possible for a volcanic lake to have a negative pH? Is this calculated based on the moles of hydrogen ions that can be donated into solution rather than the number of moles present in solution? Really good question, Trevor. So the negative pH in volcanic lakes is due to the high amount of hydro hydrogen ions present in solution. If the concentration of hydrogen ion is more than a certain concentration in mole per liter of solution, the corresponding pH will be negative. And the more hydrogen ions you have in volcanic lakes, the more negative will be the pH. So the high amount of hydrogen ions in volcanic lakes 
is due principally to acidic gas that are uh, coming from the melting rock that are below the volcano, and there are a lot of them. And if you want some scientific names, oh, for this you have hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and hydrofluoric acid. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I can do it. So here's a question from Liz from Christchurch, which is when and how is a volcano classed as dormant? So it might surprise some of you that we don't really have a clear definition for what's active, dormant and extinct at a volcano. But we know that active volcanoes are those ones that are erupting all the time or showing signs of unrest. Dormant are those ones that are volcanoes that are asleep for a long time. So that might be something like Putuaki or Itchkim in the Bay of Plenty, while on the far end, the extinct volcanoes for you in Christchurch, it might be like Banks Peninsula, which hasn't been alive for about 5 million years. So that's really how we define it. It's pretty broad, but I hope that helps. Bill from Tauranga asked, what's day-to-day -day life like for a member of the um, volcanology team at GNS? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> um, do you want to start again? Okay, Bill from Tauranga asked the question um, on the day-to-day -day life of a member of the volcanology team at GNS Science. My week starts off with a team meeting. We discuss the activity um, of the volcanoes in the past week and also look at what, what exciting things that we have to do for the week, um, weather depending. So some of the cool stuff I do, and it's quite important in terms of gathering data so we know what's happening at the volcanoes is um, gas flight sampling. So we fly in the lee of volcanoes and measure gas coming out. Um, from Narahoe, Rapehu and White Island. And another really nice job going up in the volcano, on the volcano by helicopter or something to create a lake for gases and water. And we have project work too, um, like I sampled hot springs in Kewardland, and I've done something under the water um, at White Island with scuba, and I've been working on boats, sampling water and gases. Um, it's an awesome job, it takes to amazing places. I've been doing it for 27 years nearly, and um, it still excites me. It's one of the best jobs in the world. Okay, so this question is from Letitia in South Taranaki, and she's noticed that uh, Mount Taranaki is way out to the west in the North Island, and wants to know what it's doing out there when all the rest of the volcanoes uh, further east. So this is a this is a really good observation. Um, we know there's a Maori legend that explains why Taranaki is out to the west, being banished by Tongariro. From a geology perspective, we know that it's related to the subduction zone. So uh, the plates, the Pacific plate that's going under the Australian plate is quite shallow beneath uh, Ruapehu and Tongariro, which causes those volcanoes. But as it goes deeper, the, the plate boundary is actually, well, the subducting plate is actually further west um, under Mount Taranaki. And that's why uh, we get Taranaki further west, because that's where the subducting plate is um, at that particular point. Background, are you happy with what's at the back there? Pretty random <laughs> to be fair, but um, yep, I've, um, I've got a, no, I think that's probably about right. From Azaya from Lower Hutt, the question is, can our subduction fault line set off Lake Taupo and is it still a super volcano? So I'll start with the second part of the question and the answer is yes, um, Topo is still a super volcano and in fact the whole region between Lake Topo and the north of Rotorua in the North Island is a super volcano. Um, in theory, large earthquakes could cause volcanic eruptions, but the volcanoes really have to be ready to erupt for that to happen. And we do not think that Lake Topo is ready enough to erupt so that if there was a large earthquake around the subduction zone, it could produce an eruption. I try to, to talk slower because I'm a French speaking person. From Tracy, Auckland. Is there really a freshwater lake under Rangitoto, Auckland? Wow, really interesting question. Volcanoes 
can trap fresh water in them from rainfall. If they fill up, enough spring may form under and around the, the volcanoes as the water leaks out. And as you know, in Auckland it's rain a lot. And as most volcanoes are very porous, the water usually seeps away. Rangitoto could have some fresh water in it. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> you just got on the video. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried to be snappy with it. Okay. So the question I'm dealing with here is from Seaman Harara. Uh, is the likelihood of a big eruption minimised or enhanced or neither by the occurrence of lots of little, little earthquakes in the nearby area? So thanks, Sam, for that question. This is quite a good one. The short answer is basically no, the likelihood will not rise or fall due to the local earthquakes. But what that does do is it asks the question, why are the local earthquakes occurring? What process is generating the earthquakes? This could be the volcano thinking about waking up, or it could be earthquakes that have been generated by you know, plate boundary and deformation processes. The key is, why are the earthquakes occurring and why are the rocks being broken? You know, what is driving it? So in summary, the likelihood is not likely to change. That is, they will not be a trigger for a volcanic eruption, but they may well indicate the volcano is thinking about an eruption and it could be on the process of waking up. Okay, so this is a question from Matt from Tongarero, and his question is, is the Taupo volcanic zone connected with the vents under Tongarero and Ruapehu? As there is, is there any chance of a Taupo eruption correlating with activity underneath the central plateau volcanoes? This is a really a good question. Um, we can think that in the very broad sense, all the volcanoes in the Taupo volcanic zone are related and connected because they're all on the same subduction zone. That's a bit like all the houses living on it on the same street, but each individual volcano is really its own thing. Um, they're, they're not connected um, to each other in any particular way at, at any shallow depth. The Topo vol volcano itself is actually quite a separate uh, style of volcanic system from the central plateau volcanoes. So it, we don't see any correlation with activity uh, between eruptions from Lake Taupo or eruptions at Ruapehu or Tongariro for, for that reason. Uh, it's a helicopter just flying over my head now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's a question from Bill from Tauranga, which is, what is the process of getting a career in volcanoes for a young person and for an adult looking for a career change? What's the day-to-day -day life like? So to get a career in volcanoes, there's so many ranges of, of, of interest that we can get into. So it could include geology, mathematics, physics, or chemistry. And so I got into it um, because of my interest in physical geography, so understanding how the earth works. And so I went to university and studied earth sciences and then carried on with a PhD. So for a day-to-day -day life, I might go out to the field to collect some rocks, I'll bring them back and do some analysis in the lab, and then I'll go to do some uh, further analysis or modeling. So it's a wide variety of work that's involved in my day-to-day -day life. I hope that uh, helps uh, answer the question. 